Now, to, to jump forward um, to millennia, one of the interesting things about the book was the reminder it gives that Oscar Wilde wasn't only a playwright and a wit and a homosexual, but he was also a classicist. Yes, so uh, when Wilde is introduced by his defence counsel at trial, uh, he's not introduced as a, a producer of plays or a dandy or an aesthete or an essayist. I mean, what they stress is, in fact, his classical scholarship, his gold medal in Greek, which he got at Trinity College Dublin, you know, the top first, and in, in fact, a double first, uh, in mods and greats at Oxford. This is, in fact, how Wilde is introduced to the jury. It's Wilde the classicist. Uh, he was, for example, on the first council of the Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies, the preeminent scientific and scholarly body that uh, discusses Greek matters even even today. You know, it's first council, and Oscar Wilde is on the, is on the council. So, so he, it's his classical knowledge, which, in fact, we, we tend to forget, but it's so important to him. I mean, the famous love that dare not speak his name speech is, you know, it's suffused with Platonic philosophy. He cites Plato. In fact, it's his Plato's formulation from the Symposium of the Phaedrus, which gets into the, the text of what is perhaps arguably the, the greatest work of uh, homosexual apologia of the 19th century. And, the, and, and it's classical. And it's wild, you know, projecting uh, his own classical learning into the courtroom for, to argue for uh, political change. But, but but of course it's a, a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because the classical is is non-Christian and you know associated with practices which Victorian morality would would find abhorrent. Yes, and, and Greece has this sort of double-edged aspect for the Victorians. Uh, I mean, the Victorians loved Greek sculpture; they praised you know the Greek arts and talk uh, in hushed tones about Greek philosophy. But then there's always the sort of elephant in the room, which is Greek pederasty. And, and what do you do with it? And, you know, sometimes you, know, you deny it. Sometimes you try and pretend that it was just some strange form of education. But it's something that you keep coming back to. And, it's, uh, and of course, there are people who won't let you forget it. I mean, that's the other, I, I think, really important element in this story is the, the first generation of homosexual apologists who are using Hellenism to make a political case. They say, well, look, if you're going to you know, celebrate Hellenism, if you're going to regard the Greeks as the founders of, of Western culture, then there's something you're also going to have to face up uh, to. And, and that's, you know, the use of, of, of Greece uh, in, in its political form that I find really interesting. Do you think sexuality is the area of human life where our view of the classical world is most remote from from the reality where it really has sort of slipped its moorings and has gone off into its own little fantasy realm I think it would have to be one of the contenders again you know uh, as I you know, said, said earlier one just keeps going back to these myths that we tell ourselves uh, about the the Greeks and Romans I mean how can we have got it so wrong about the orgy I mean how can we've got it you know, so wrong about you know what Roman matrons get up to I mean this is this is completely bizarre and and why do why do we also uh, be so rational about certain aspects and so distrusting of our sources yet the moment sex comes into play we kind of roll all over, abandon our critical faculties uh, and become gullible in ways that we just would never be about anything else. And uh, I think it really there must be something about sexuality that, that catches off, us off guard or is something that we're not prepared to to engage with in the, with the kind of critical seriousness that um, that we do in, in other areas. I mean, that, that takes me to my last question, really, which is, researching this project, did you speculate on what it is about our, our human psyche that, that finds so much sort of nourishment for our fantasies in in the classical world, almost as something that we sort of need to have? I mean, you, you talk about the, the limits of the, the study not, not looking at non-Western appropriations of of the classical past, but but did you did you sort of think about what it what it is about it that has been so attractive to the Western imagination for so long? I, I think the thing about sex that makes sex so important and so interesting to us is that it combines things such as the body, love pleasure, the, the really crucial things that make us human and that we regard as the, you know, absolutely important aspects of our lives. And I think that that's the, the issue really that makes sex so, so important is it's the, the bit where everything comes together. Uh, and, and that's why I think you know, sex 
is so important and also perhaps so dangerous and also the place where we tend to get lost. Alistair Blanchard. Sex, Vice and Love from Antiquity to Modernity, is available now in hardback. There are other podcasts available in this series. Just go to the Blackwell Classics microsite, which is accessible from the home page, blackwell.co.uk. There you'll also find lots of information on new and forthcoming titles in the field, as well as an extensive browsable backlist. I hope you'll join me again soon for another Blackwell Classics podcast. In the next programme, my guest will be Paul Krivacek, and we'll be talking about his new book, Babylon. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye.